그렇구만 다음시에 Doctoral candidate, evaluation committee, invited guests, awesome. ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this public defense arrangement marking the end of Mr. Fabrice Kalin's doctoral study work. A special welcome to uh, the head of the department of civil and transport engineering. Marit Sterwan, who is uh, visiting in Eunice for this occasion. Before today's presentation of the trial lecture, I want to briefly present the candidate, the evaluation committee, and his advisors. Mr. Fabrice Kalin obtained his master's degree at the famous university. Ecole Nationale de Ponce de in Paris in the year of 2000. He was a graduate student at <coughs> UNIS in the year 2000. He was employed as a researcher at Rogelandsforskning from 2002 to 2004. And then he started his PhD studies in 2004 as the student <coughs> at Faculty of Engineering Science and Technology, Department of Civil and Transport Engineering at NTNU. The Faculty of Science and Technology appointed an evaluation committee with the following members. Professor Dr. Sven Knudsen. He is a professor in Geotechnical Engineering at Lulu University of Technology. He has his Master of Science degree from the University of Lund in 1972 and his PhD degree from the same university in 1983. He has been a professor at New Law University since 1992. He is appointed as the first opponent for the thesis defense. Dr. Anneliese Bergen, she is um, appointed as the second opponent. She is the president of her own consulting company, Geofrost AS. She has her Master of Science degree from the Norwegian University of Technology in 1977 and her PhD degree from the same university in 1983. My name is Kåre Sennesett and I am a professor emeritus in geotechnical engineering at the Department of Civil and Transport Engineering at NTNU. I was asked to be the administrator for the evaluation committee's work. The main supervisors for the doctoral work by Fabrice Kalin has been Lars Gande and Knut Heilem. Both are professors at the Department of Civil and Transport Engineering at NTNU. Dr. The public defense program is divided in two parts. The first, the first part starts now, in a few minutes, and is a trial lecture of 45, up to 45 minutes duration. A prescribed subject was given the candidate two weeks prior to the lecture presentation. The second part consists of a public defense of the thesis, where the candidate presents his work, followed by the discussion uh, by the between the first and second opponent and the candidate. This part will take place in this room at 9.30 tomorrow. So now we should be ready for the trial lecture and the title you may see here. And I give the word to Fabrice, please. Hello everyone and thank you for coming. I just turn off the light. Here we go. I will uh, divide my talk in um, several parts. I will start with a little bit of geography about Arctic coasts. Uh, then I will talk about uh, climate change in the Arctic. And I will uh, 
continue on uh, the topic of um, coastal erosion globally and, and then specifically in the Arctic. And finally, I will uh, see uh, how, the, how the predicted changes in the climate are going to affect coastal erosion in the Arctic and see a little bit on mitigation measures. So let's start with some geography. Here's the Arctic. There are different, different definitions of, uh, of the Arctic. And, uh, and in this talk, I will, uh, I will concentrate on uh, the coasts of the Arctic Basin. Uh, these coasts, uh, when, we, when we consider these coasts, we, we exclude parts of the Canadian archipel archipelago and parts of uh, Greenland, Scandinavia, the Ferrer, Ferrer uh, Islands, Iceland. If we start uh, from uh, Greenwich or uh, Svalbard, and then we turn to the towards east, so we have uh, the Barents Sea, we have uh, Novaya Semlya, and south of Novaya Semlya we have Petrora Sea, then we have the Kara Sea, and the Taimir Pen Peninsula, and we have um, the Laptev Sea, number four. Uh, the Siberian islands between four and five. Then we have the East Siberian uh, Sea. Uh, just above number six, we have uh, Brangel Island. Then we're in the Chukchi Sea, the first Russian part. Then we cross the Bering Strait and we go to the American part of the Chukchi Sea. And uh, over to Canada, we have the Beaufort Sea or the Beaufort Sea, both in uh, of the U.S. and Canada, we just uh, east uh, west of is it east east of number eight, we have the Mackenzie River Delta, uh, and then uh, nine the Beaufort, the Canadian Beaufort, and ten the um, Canadian Arctic Archipelago, and uh, of course the the northern part of uh, Greenland. Um, in these areas. Tidal ranges are mostly below two meters. There are some exceptions, but as a rule, they are below two meters. And they, the coastlines uh, represent 34% uh, of uh, the world's coastlines. Of course, if uh, uh, this is using uh, something called the world vector shoreline, which is a, a uniform or um, a standard uh, standard scale to measure the coastlines. Coastlines uh, are fractals and, uh, and the, their length depend on the scale you measure, you measure with. So 34% of, uh, of the world's coastlines. And I will base a lot of my talk on, uh, on a classification made by uh, a, a research project called ACD, uh, which stands for Arctic um, Coastal Dynamics Project. That is a project uh, led by a person called uh, Paul Overduin, and he was kind enough to to send me an article which is in press, and, uh, and which um, is a start in the goal of this project to to establish um, uh, rates and magnitudes of erosion and accumulation in the Arctic, and uh, and a classification in a digital form. The, the, all the publications from this uh, the, the, this project is a, it's an international project and uh, started from um, uh, the ISC, the international the Inter intergovernmental Arctic Science Council, and the International Permafrost Association, and they have regular uh, workshops and these are uh, available online on the AVE uh, website. Um, they also published um, or pu published articles in a special edition of uh, Geomarian Letters in 2008. This article uh, that I'm referring to it will be published in a journal called Estuaries and Coasts. So in their classification, they uh, observed that 65% of the coasts of the Arctic are unlitified. And we'll, come, uh, we'll uh, go further in detail the classification. Of course, as you see here, 
uh, sorry for the legends, it's a little bit uh, difficult to read probably, but uh, all the pur purple is uh, permafrost, uh, continuous permafrost and then sporadic permafrost. So, so uh, a common, common uh, feature of Arctic coast is that there is the presence of permafrost. And we see this here on this histogram, the average volume of uh, ground ice in, um, in Arctic coast in, in, again I'm talking about these coasts that were cl classified as about 25% of the, of the total, uh, total Arctic coast. So 18.4% 18, 18 in average of uh, ground ice content, mostly below 30% and 10% uh, of uh, coastlines have below 2% uh, ground ice. On the regional level, we see that, uh, well, if we start with the Svalbard, we have zero. Uh, so it's not that I'm a geologist, but I assume it's because it's mostly rock. So it, it is permafrost, but the ground ice content is uh, quite small. And uh, the richest uh, ice content we find in uh, the Beaufort Sea, both the US and the Canadian about 30%, close to 30%. So that was it for the geography. About uh, climate change. When we go into climate change, uh, there are a number of different sources. Of course, I, I assume everybody has heard about the IPCC. Uh, mm -hmm. They released their fourth uh, assessment report. They called it, they, re they, they released, uh, they released regularly assessment reports, and so the first, second, and in 2007 was the fourth, uh, which is basically uh, the, the panel uh, uh, browses through the, the literature on uh, climate change and assembles it into reports. So this is based on peer-reviewed uh, literature from all, all possible fields. And there is a special, uh, sp special um, uh, chapter on, uh, on the Arctic, which is um, which draws a lot from uh, a report called ACIA, Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, uh, which is a collaboration between 300 scientists uh, initiated by the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Arctic Council. Um, and the data that we, I will use now for, to, pre to present uh, and the climate change data I will use is mostly from uh, ACIA. There has been uh, there have been other uh, initiatives for the Arctic, spe specific for the Arctic, from uh, NOAA. Uh, in 2006, the state, the state of the Arctic report and, uh, and NOAA uh, yearly updates, something called this, the Arctic report card, which was uh, recently updated for 2010. WWF also has uh, had a um, quite comprehensive report on the, on the Arctic climate change in 2008. And then there are regional uh, initiatives, like in Norway, uh, Nordklima, there is uh, CICERU, uh, which is a research center. They also have um, work on that. Uh, we have uh, the Intergovernmental um, Arctic, uh, International Arctic Research Council, which I believe is in Alaska, uh, Arctic Net in Canada, and, uh, and Arc, uh, Natural Resources Canada. So all these are, uh, and, and, uh, and most of this information, or uh, actually all the information is available online, uh, IPCC, ACIA even has some of the graphic, graphics I, I use are from uh, the ACIA report, they put the graphics on them. So, uh, uh, a common uh, observation from uh, these sources is that that the, the Arctic is warming faster than the, the rest of the world. And why is uh, why is that? Well, there are five uh, five uh, main points for that. Main reasons for that. The first one is uh, the albedo feedback. So uh, the albedo is uh, essentially the the energy that is reflected from the Earth's uh, surface. And so the higher the albedo, the, the less the surface is warmed up, the less energy remains on the surface. 
And uh, if we look at the albedo of snow, it's uh, between 0.4 to 0.9. Ocean ice between 0.5 to 0.7. And uh, ocean is 0.1. So a factor uh, 4 to 9 in albedo between open ocean and uh, ocean co covered with ice or snow. So, so the albedo effect is that uh, as, the, as the ice pack, Arctic ice pack is melting, the albedo of the Arctic is increasing, and hence the, the energy, um, the total energy going into the ocean is increasing. So that is a feedback loop. Another reason is that in the Arctic, uh, the extra energy uh, goes into warming, whereas in the tropics, a lot of it goes into evaporation, or more of it goes into evaporation. The third point is that the atmosphere is actually thinner on the poles <coughs> than in the tropics or at the equator. It's seven kilometers thick at the poles and 17 at the equator. So the thinner the layer, the faster it goes to warm it up. The fourth point is that the sea ice is actually an insulation layer, like, you have, like snow on, on the ground. It, it insulates the ocean from cold temperatures outside. Uh, so when the sea ice disappears, you, you lose this insulation. Uh, and uh, a fifth point, which is a hypothesis or a possibility that global circulation pattern, patterns may warm up the Arctic more than other regions. So what are, what are, are the projections from the ACIA when it comes to um, climate change? In, in climate change uh, science, uh, scientists use uh, use scenarios. Different uh, there there are a handful of scenarios uh, that that um, predict how the world will be in 2050, for example. And there is uh, the scenario used by uh, the ICIA. So some are pessimistic or they're optimistic when it comes to the use of um, renewable energies and population. And and uh, the ICIA based their uh, report on a scenario called B2. That scenario sees 10 billion people in 2050, 50% of the, of the energy is CO2 free, and 600 parts per million CO2 in 2100. So that is uh, not the worst case scenario, not either the best, best case, it's uh, somewhere uh, in between. And now, um, it should be noted that uh, independently of the scenarios which are run in basically in, in the numer numerical models, the <coughs> all all, uh, all results predict uh, warming in the Arctic. It's just the amplitude which is which differs. So let's look at the surface air, air temperature in 2100. This is the pre <coughs> predicted surface air temperature. Um, if we look at past data, the temperature has risen in the Arctic almost twice the rate of the rest of the world. The temperature is rising mostly, or most in the winter, more rapidly than in the summer. And the projections are that uh, it will rise three to five degrees over land and uh, seven degrees over the seas. And some of, sorry, some of the strongest increases will be in northern Russia. And there is the pack ice uh, shrinkage, which uh, I believe everyone has seen, uh, has read about in the media. And the scenarios give quite different, uh, some scenarios predict an ice-free Arctic by, by the end of the century. Um, scenario B2 gives uh, uh, a loss of 50% of the summer sea ice by the end of the century and 15 to 20% of the annual average uh, extent of the sea ice. Uh, we, we're talking about the extent now, not about the volume, the extent of the, the sea ice. Over the last 30 years, um, the annual average extent has decreased by 8%. 8 and uh, the summer sea ice uh, has decreased by 15 to 20%. The minimum, minimum um, <coughs> Record the rec minimum record uh, of sea ice extent was in 2007, and 2007, 2008, 
and 2010 were the three lowest lowest uh, extents measured in the summer. Uh, the sea ice is um, is measured by since 90, the extent is measured since 1978 with the uh, satellites, and so the, the the data series go back to 90, 1978, and uh, with time satellite satellite uh, data has of course. Uh, uh, increase in quality. Uh, the satellites use are uh, one, one called ISAT, which was the, the commission last year. And there is an ISAT two coming. There is a European sat there are European satellites ERS one two and VSAT. And uh, and recently this, these uh, with the laser altimetry, we have been able to measure actually the, the thickness of the of the sea ice. And uh, there is a project, uh, IP-wide project called Democles, which has been uh, working on that. And uh, the thickness data go in the same, have the same trend. Uh, thickness is, is um, or the, the Arctic ice pack is uh, thinning. Precipitations are um, expected to increase, and uh, especially, especially uh, winter, um, uh, most of the increase would be as rain. And the, the, the amount of uh, rain on snow events is also expected to increase. Um, in the past century, precipitations have increased by 8%. And um, the prediction is that they, they will increase by 20% by the end of the century. Uh, we should note that it is difficult to, uh, to measure winter time and the precipitations. And also, uh, there, is, there, there is a sparseness of data in, uh, in the Arctic. There are a limited number of stations. The permafrost <coughs> has warmed by 2% in recent years, and it's expected that the southern boundary of uh, permafrost will move by hundreds of kilometers. We see especially well, both in, in Russia and uh, Canada, Alaska. Then there's the sea level. Here we have, uh, for this one, we have different scenarios. So B2 is the one uh, that I've that I'm referring to for the rest of the data, which is coming here. And you see V2 is somewhere in the middle. It's not the worst case. So sea levels have been rising by 10, 20, 20 centimeters uh, last, uh, the last century. And the projections are that the rise will, uh, the, the rise will increase in rate, and uh, the sea levels will increase by 50 centimeters uh, by the end of the century somewhere between 10 and 90 centimeter. If we take the extre ex exter extreme, or here actually, yeah, extreme values, between 10 and 90 centimeters. And this is due to the fact that the ocean is expanding when, uh, when, the, when it warms up, warms up. And of course, uh, the ice caps in Greenland, or the ice cap in Greenland is melting. So the combination. So, and the ocean in the Arctic is actually expanding more than in the rest of the world. So this sea level rise is, is higher in the, in the Arctic. The yeah, highest levels are in the US Arctic and uh, the Canadian archipelago. On the other hand, there, are, uh, there is, uh, for example, the Canadian archipelago, the, the land is actually rising. Uh, something uh, is phenomenal is a, is a static um, rebound, which is actually the, or essentially the, the Earth's crust, which is Bouncing, bouncing back after the the last ice age, uh, and and that um, for that reason the Canadian archipelago coastlines are actually rising. Uh, Greenland also, and um, or uh, in, in Greenland the same. The, the Greenland is also rebounding in Scandinavia too. But in Scandinavia, in Norway, uh, for example, in Tromsø, there is an article by Jamie uh, in 2007. They, pr they predict uh, a rise of between 35 centimeter and, and one meter in Tromsø, for example, of the sea level. So despite, despite the fact that the Earth is crust is, or the, despite isostatic rebound, it will, the sea levels will rise. And in some, re some regions, uh, like in, in the Bofor Sea and in Siberia, uh, the, the Earth, uh, the, 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 there is isostatic depression, that is, the Earth is, is, uh, is lowering, so then, See the, the, the both uh, phenomena accumulate, and the sea level rise. The relative sea level rise is even higher. 
the snow cover, uh, the snow cover extent, the uh, 30 past years has uh, decreased in by 10 percent, and uh, the projections are it will decrease by 10 to 20 percent within the end of the uh, extra within the end of the century, uh, and the greatest decline is in springtime. Uh, now. The Arctic report card in 2010 came with an update of these uh, predictions and uh, basically what, what uh, the researchers found was that the uh, melting of the, of the Greenland uh, ice cap was accelerating, so it was going faster than predicted. And um, uh, eight of the ten lowest sea ice summer minima in the last, uh, happened in the last decade. So the which is uh, which is uh, I will not say a proof, but um, uh, emphasizes the, the the decrease of the sea ice, the Arctic ice pack. So the northeast uh, for the first time in September, the northeast and the northwest passages were ice free, and uh, that allowed uh, Berger Öslund and a couple of uh, friends to sail around the Arctic in one season with uh, this small boat here. I guess uh, Colin Archer must be turning in his grave. Um, but of course, uh, in climate science there are uh, a lot of uncertainties, and that is due to climate's complexity. Um, <coughs> For example, uh, I mentioned the the albedo feedback, the ice ice albedo feedback uh, mechanism, which is not very well modeled uh, as of today. There is uh, another uh, mechanism, which is when the more you have open water, the more you have evaporation, so you get more clouds, clouds, and then you get more uh, reflected infrared radiation back to the surface. So that could actually warm up even more. Uh, then there is uh, the absence of snow, as I said earlier, the snow acts as an insulation layer, so when you lose snow, the ground is less insulated, so that, that will actually cool down. And all these proce processes are not very well modeled for, for today. Uh, models today are global models and uh, to very little, little extent regional models. Uh, of course, researchers are working on that. And, uh, and the regional models are coming up, uh, have been coming up, up in re recent years. And finally, there is the possibility of an abrupt, uh, abrupt change, because everything we've seen here has been very linear, but we don't understand the complexity of the climate well enough. It could. Uh, there have been in the past abrupt changes, and that could very well occur today. But bearing, bearing an abrupt change, there is a cons consensus to say at least that there is a warming, or, and there will be a warming. Okay, so now let's go over to coastal erosion. And I will start with coastal erosion in temperate coasts. And what are the mechanisms of coastal erosion? Um, the, most, the most important uh, mechanism is uh, wave action. Uh, waves, the waves, uh, uh, when um, when the waves break on on the shore, they press they press the air inside cracks. Uh, that acts as a, a wedge and um, and fractures the rocks even more. And when the when the wave recedes, the the compressed air expands in an explosive way and and it fractures the rocks. So you have this destruction mechanism from the waves. You have abrasion uh, from which is a mechanical wearing and grinding, uh, grinding away of rock surfaces by friction and impact of rock particles. Uh, and these rock particles themselves are of course grinding against each other. That is attrition. So the abrasion is when they abrade the shore and attrition is this abrasion them in between. And salt will go into cracks and expand uh, when when the when the coast dries uh, at low at low tide, for example, and and uh, crack up um, the rocks. 
And then there are a number of other uh, processes, biological, chemical, there's thermal cracking, uh, and, uh, and of course currents are removing uh, the eroded uh, material. Um, there are different factors that, it, that uh, influence uh, coastal erosion, like be the beach profile, the geology, and the vegetation. So the main difference between Arctic coast and temperate coast is the presence of permafrost and the, perma the presence of uh, sea ice. And, the, and with permafrost, we see uh, an addition, a, a new process, which is which we don't see uh, uh, in other places. I forgot to put uh, reference here, but that is from um, Landtweet, uh, the the article which is in the press that I mentioned earlier. So the way the the sea by thermal uh, uh, convection removes heat from or removes uh, or heats up the coast, um, thaws the permafrost. Here we have so we have a, a permafrost coast or a permafrost uh, cliff, and um, and undercuts undercuts the the, the cliff and call and it creates uh, what is called a thermal erosional niche. So once this and if it's big enough, the block will fall, especially if there are ice wedges. It will fall off, and the, and the process will continue. This is called thermal abrasion. I have a picture of that taken here, in, uh, or not far away from here in Drevnese. You see that it's, uh, it's not as clear as on the figure. But here we have debris from fallen uh, rocks from the top, and the waves are eroding. From, from below. Uh, now the sea ice. The sea ice has um, has several effects. It uh, the first, which is not this picture. I move too fast here. The first effect is that it dampens the effect of the waves. When the sea, when the ice, when the sea is covered with ice, the waves either are not non-existent or at least uh, dampened. That is the main effect of the sea ice. Another effect is that here we have a picture from uh, Svea, Badiness in Svea, and where the, which is, here is a beach, actually the beach is covered in uh, ice, and we have an ice foot to the left, and, and all this ice is actually holding together uh, material which is, actu which is actually loose. So without the ice it would erode very fast, when, when it's covered in ice it doesn't erode. And here is an example from uh, East Fjorden. Here it's uh, uh, a mixture of ice and uh, ice and snow, and it's further out into the season. You see that the material which are exposed are are exposed to erosion, and the rest of the beach is, is protected. The same happens with the snow drifts. This is also from Levnes, uh, and uh, these patches here are patches of snow, and these are themselves undercut actually. Right? And then there is the some places uh, subsea permafrost occur, and and that limits the amount of uh, sediments removed. The, the subsea permafrost, as the ice, uh, which I showed earlier on the beach, uh, keeps the, the sediments together. But sea ice can also erode. It can uh, there is sea ice can uh, you can observe sea ice encroachment. Uh, this here is in a pileup, and you see that this ice obviously contains a lot of sediments, uh, gravel, and so that is one one mechanism of um, erosion. Another mechanism of uh, erosion by sea ice is that um, um, the the sea ice freezes in in shallow places, freezes to the to the. Um, to the seabed and um, and it and traps sediments from the seabed. And a more significant source of uh, erosion by sea ice, um, maybe a little bit surprising, but the um, se sediments are entrained by frazil ice anchor or anchor ice, which are different types of ice. Uh, anchor ice occur on the seabed, and. Um, and are then uh, moved away. They are entrapped in this ice and, 
and further in the season they are moved away. And that, uh, according to Forbes, an article in 2005, uh, that may amount on the on parts of the Alaskan coast, coast it may amount to 15 times the amount of sediments uh, released by by rivers. So it is a, a substantial amount. I will just jerk over the two next pictures. What are the erosion rates in the Arctic? Um, we observe among the highest erosion rates in the world between uh, or up to 20 meters per year. And these rates are particularly high if we adjust for the length of the season, because uh, when, when there is sea ice, no erosion occurs. The ranges are uh, commonly between 1 and 5 meters per year. And if we, if we look at, at it on a regional level, we see that the highest rates occur in the Beaufort Sea. We have an average rate of 1.1 meter per year. In the east of Aaron Sea, 0.9 meter per year. And in the left of Sea, 0.7 meter per year. And if we show that on the map, this is a map from, uh, here it is, in the yeah, in article and press. The green, the green coasts, we have little erosion. Uh, yellow coast between oh, 0 and 1 meter per year. <coughs> uh, orange coast between 1 and 2. And uh, red coast between 2 and 10. So a lot of the ero erosion is, is uh, taking place in, uh, or the, the Siberian coast is uh, particularly exposed and also in uh, Alaska and, and the before, uh, before uh, part of uh, Canada. Finally, we'll look at the, the effects of climate change on, on um, coastal erosion in the Arctic. And uh, here again I use as a source uh, the ICIA report from 2005. Um, erosion rates have increased by uh, the past 30 years, and that is due to uh, thawing of permafrost, uh, rising sea levels, the reduced extent of sea ice, uh, and also uh, the increased number of storms and or the the, um, uh, the increased numbers of of storms because the season <laughs> the open ice season is longer, and the the increased of the intensity of the storms. And uh, one effect is that some of the some of the coasts like in the Arctic archipelago where there used to be sea ice all year round, we now become uh, exposed and uh, we will observe a new type of erosion or we don't know how much erosion will occur there. Um, and there is the effect of, uh, of rainfalls uh, with with more intense rainfalls, there would be more runoff. Here again, there are um, strong spatial, or there is a, there are uncertainties. Uh, there is a strong spatial variability uh, in most factors: ice content, erosion rates, uh, and and there is uncertainty also due to the lack of site-specific models. We have mostly global models. There are works on that too. Uh, a researcher called Will Perry is uh, working on coupling uh, atmospheric ice models, uh, atmospheric ocean models with um, ice uh, ice models. I have uh, to finish. I, I have uh, some pictures from um, places in the Arctic. Uh, this one is a, a, a place called Shishmaref. It's in um, in Alaska, north of the Bering Strait in the Chukchi Sea, and uh, where erosion rates um, have increased um, sensibly in the past years. One year, 15, 15 meters during one storm, 15 meters of coast were washed away, and. Uh, 
the sea ice in Jishmaref is coming now in Christmas where it used to come in October, so that has, uh, that has an effect, clear effect. Um, they are, they have moved some homes. Uh, there are 600 inhabitants in this village. Uh, they have moved some houses and they are considering to re relocate uh, the, whole, uh, the whole village. There is an example from uh, Valanday uh, in the Petrola Sea in, in uh, Russia. This is an oil terminal in Valanday. Uh, the coasts over there are originally not, not prone to erosion, but because, uh, because of human activity, the, they have uh, destroyed the dunes that used to be there and they have in order to extract uh, or to mine the sand. And uh, now, for this particular oil ter terminal, they have uh, and great challenges with the uh, uh, coast, coastal recession. Um, I took some some uh, local examples from uh, Fredheim. Fredheim has been uh, moved. It's in um, Tempelfjorn. It has been moved at least once. There is another cabin in Svalbard also that has been moved. And an example from Greenland, uh, Mönstedhus in uh, northeast Greenland, uh, which they did not move, obviously did not move in time. <laughs> well, what, what can we do to, um, to protect ourselves against coastal erosion? Uh, there are a number of good, good uh, or there is there is quite some good literature on the on the topic. There is. Uh, the Encyclopedia of, uh, of um, Coastal Science by Schwartz in 2005, a very good, uh, very good book. There is the Coastal Engineering Manual from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is a very extensive manual, and usually or almost everyone is always referring to that. There is this uh, small book here, Arctic Coastal Processes. We have it in the library and Slope Protection Design from 1979, I think, from uh, edited by uh, two well-known uh, researchers in the area, Chen and Leidersdorf. Um, basically, we have two types of solutions. We, have, we can build hard structures, uh, that is, like uh, groins, uh, breakwaters. So groins are, are uh, you can say, breakwaters that are perpendicular to the coast, and you have you put them with a space, maybe 50 meters, every 50 meters you put the groins and you limit the, the cross shore transport of sediments. And breakwaters, sea walls. Uh, the problem in the, in the Arctic, uh, that is something I, I have been working, I, I have been working in during my PhD is the availability of rocks to build these structures. Uh, Many of the coasts are uh, many of the, the region of the areas. Uh, in many of the areas, you don't have access to good uh, rocks. Another possibility, or another type of solutions, are so-called soft structures, and uh, that uh, is, for example, to fill with the local material. Uh, for example, a beach, uh, you fill you you fill with the sand. Uh, it's called beach nourish nourishment. Uh, they use that. Uh, uh, Well-known example is in Florida, where where they I, I think filled a uh, hundred meter wide beach, uh, and that may be a, a good solution too. And of course, in the the last re resort is uh, to simply relocate the village or the infrastructure. When we build uh, remediation structures, uh, we always need to take into account the sediment budget in, in the whole area. Because if we stop sediment transport from, uh, let's say, uh, across shore, we stop it at one point, then uh, down current from that, we will have loss of sediment. So uh, whenever we build a structure, we modify this, uh, this regime. And, uh, and in many, in many, in many cases, uh, that has led to 
surprises. Um, in Shishmaref's, uh, they built a seawall. This is actually a chicken net, uh, chicken cage net. And uh, they filled it with uh, rocks. It's a construction method called uh, gabion. I think it's a French word. And in um, this here is an island, it's uh, a barrier island, Kivarina. It's in the Chukchi Sea, north of the Bering Strait. And they also, they've also built a seawall, but uh, this seawall has been partly destroyed during the storm. So they um, also here they're considering to relocate. And they have a problem with the waste, uh, waste storage containment area that is uh, that is eroding away, and that would pose uh, that could pose uh, great environmental uh, problems. That was it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are certainly got. <laughs> Which is uh, quite an overview of what we expect considering climate change and uh, certainly what we can expect to see along the shorelines. Now I would like the opponents to uh, ask questions or comments if they have any. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I was very pleased to uh, listen to this uh, good uh, uh, summary of all the uh, information which we are uh, getting from different sources all the time in media and uh, in uh, different scientific reports. Uh, so it's, and good pictures, good illustrations, uh, pictures which uh, at least uh, I haven't uh, seen before, so that was uh, very nice. Uh, I, I, I would like to hear some comments from you about uh, uh, these different scenarios because that, you, you pointed out there are different scenarios and there's very big difference uh, uh, what we can expect uh, around the next uh, century. Uh, very big difference. Uh, how do you think these different scenarios affect the, the Yeah. Well, I think we've seen that the, 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 um, the major reasons of increased coastal erosion in the Arctic are the loss of sea ice and uh, uh, the warming of the, the sea that would increase this thermal abrasion process and then the sea level rise. Uh, so, and all these are, of course, directly linked to the rise in sea air temperature, uh, in the surface air temperature. So, um, I'm not that I'm a specialist in the area, but I would expect that um, the results that the scenarios give in terms of, of uh, surface air temperature are uh, quite um, critical to, um, to to evaluate the, the effect on the coastal erosion. Did I did I answer your question? Yes, yes, uh, I agree. I think also, uh, and, and uh, that, that that is something I think. Uh, it's worth mentioning, and, and you did it, uh, but I'd like to comment on, uh, upon it. And that is the uh, melting of permafrost. And uh, due to melting of permafrost, there is a release of methane. Yeah. Uh, is this something? I haven't been looking uh, precisely into that, but uh, it's true that, um, so in the permafrost, uh, the per the, in the permafrost, areas, the ice is, is basically binding together uh, the, the material and also in, in these ice rich areas or in this ice rich, in, in this ice rich ground there is also some methane uh, entrapped. So as the permafrost is and also, uh, also underwater, subsea permafrost also uh, um, contains methane. So as the permafrost is melting, all this methane is released in the atmosphere. 
And but I cannot answer it. I don't have the figures. I don't know how many because methane is a much uh, stronger uh, greenhouse gas than CO2. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know the the, the order of magnitude uh, of this methane rate. I, uh, what I from what I've heard in mainstream media, it, it's quite big. But but I don't I don't have the figures. And I also think that a uh, uh, lot of organic material. Uh, will not degrade to the uh, degree uh, it should degrade normally exactly. because it's frozen uh, uh, what, when those grasses of plants and trees etc in comfort region then it's frozen and then the degradation stops yeah. but uh, then when it all falls then the degradation starts again so it's not just the end product methane right. it, uh, it's also from the Start a new starting process of the producing methane yeah. duration. Yeah, and that is a point I skipped. But uh, the um, the from an environmental or biological point of view, the erosion has also an effect because it releases a lot of carbon into the ecosystems. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm again, that is not either an area I'm as uh, expert in, but uh, but it is something that is mentioned. Uh, in some of the reports, yeah. I think in the ACIA, yeah. but I'm, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, you talked a lot about the erosion rate, and I wonder if you have some kind of definition about it? Well, it's based, based on um, uh, observations, uh, both satellite observations and um, ground station observations but it is it is a challenge to to define because uh, basically what uh, Landtritt and, uh, and the other researchers did in their study is that they divided the coast in segments of different of different length and they and for each segment they used the data that was available and they and they uh, put a, an average erosion rate for that region so you have you know, you you have uh, quite some difference in the quality uh, between those segments, and and if you if you have if you base uh, uh, well segments where you have few ground stations, you will you will have um, uh, the, the data quality of course will, will be poor. Uh, you have another another uh, issue that, that is raised is that. Uh, in, in many of the stations, they all only observe once a year. So what you actually observe, so let's say, I think it was in September they're observing. So what they actually observe in, in September, they see the erosion that was through the, through the autumn and then in the next uh, spring season. Um, uh, so, so, so they cannot, uh, so it's, uh, well, it's a little bit off, off topic, but uh, it's difficult to to then um, um, point to which mechanisms are most important for, for the, the erosion. But um, I don't think I answered your question exactly. I, I didn't give a, I mean, for, for, for one station in particular, uh, you, you, you measure how much the coast re receives, of course. And uh, I'm not completely sure how, how they averaged for a whole segment. And how they combine the the satellite data and and the ground station data. Yeah, I was uh, kind of questioning what is measured and and is that the coastal line? Yeah. Okay. Um, what part of the coast or where where on the where on the shore? How to define when you say four meter or one meter? Yeah. Yeah. But basically, you have to. Well, the shore is uh, they divide the shore in the offshore. Uh, shore face and onshore uh, division, some some kind of division like that, and so basically I don't remember exactly. They let's say they they say the top of the uh, or top of the shore face, and they see how much that retreats. So so that you can define uh, quite precisely on the shore. Uh, yeah. Well, I should I find that? I saw some pictures that was really clear. Yes, but uh, yeah. 
Well, they have this uh, this uh, classification, of, or they divide the shore in those different parts. And I, I know I agree with you. I, I I have also seen, I have read these. Uh, of course, researchers don't don't all agree on how to how to divide the shore. And and then when you're on site, you will not always recognize where the. Uh, High tide level is, or that kind of that kind of uh, um, um, points that look very nice on the paper, but you don't find them back in reality. Yeah. We, we can look at that picture. Uh, we can very easily imagine that. Uh, at least we can imagine that uh, there has been an earlier coastline, more far, more, more close to the sea. And then the, the, the being put up in this Gabion or Gabions. Uh, but but uh, probably we would say that there has been erosion here. But uh, that doesn't mean that the coastline has uh, moved very much. But the, the land, mm. which is a little bit greenish here, has disappeared. So is this erosion or is it not erosion? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, if I remember correctly, how they uh, how they um, defined it, um, it is the uh, the top of the shore face. So the basically the boundary between the shore and the back shore. So that means the top of the gabions. So that would be the top of the gabions, yeah. But I am not a hundred percent sure. So that means if there is just a replacement of material, uh, that would be looked upon as as a rock. Yeah. Uh, they they define it. Uh, and what I can say, I know I, I know that they define it quite precisely in the methods part of the article. How oh, and it is important to define to define. I agree on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Should they uh, allow the audience to? Uh, with a question, or I suppose there is someone that might. Yes, there is one. Um, you mentioned Svabat, and since you're on Svabat, it's always nice to know your opinion on Svabat, and you were presenting us that there's hardly any erosion going on in Svabat. <laughs> That's part of the result of the ATV <laughs> network, which I know very well. So I would like your comments. How well do you believe in these things? <laughs> I, I was uh, considering removing the spot part the line from the graph because I have been working on it myself and uh, and the pictures I was in um, I talked with uh, Susan Bard uh, from the from the Dick Santicorn and, uh, and we have this picture from Fredheim we know that there is erosion but the, the, the main point is that if we average it over the whole coasts it will look like a zero zero percent I believe that is possible uh, but I am, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you have, uh, your, your, your opinion on the topic is probably more informed than mine. Oh, no, I don't think so, but I just want you to let us know if you think we have the right amount of measurements to no. actually say yeah. such a conclusion. Yeah. No, clearly, clearly not, I, I agree. <laughs> and, and it is, uh, again, I said in the start, uh, they only have 25% of the total of the Arctic coast uh, classified, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it is, and uh, you can imagine that the most effort is placed, of course, where there are people living and, and uh, where the effects of climate change are the biggest, which is in the Beaufort Sea, uh, in the Chukchi Sea, in the Sea. These, these are the places which are the most exposed. So, so, so it, is, it is probably a combination also that, that you, you don't have that much observation from Svalbard and probably not that many people care because we don't have a we even not have an erosion pro uh, problem here in Longyearbyen that I know of, and that is the main settlement. Mm -hmm. Could be a new research project, I suppose. And one else who want to yeah. clarify something? Yes, please. Yeah. Do, may you explain that uh, you, you can expect some strong erosion near some object of coastal development, industrial object, guys, harbors. If the erosion will be the same, or or if some well construction can uh, increase, for example, erosion. Yeah. What 
Мы will comment on Maybe, maybe, may, maybe introduce some new special type of construction in order to avoid uh, erosion near construction. Yeah, but basically the, 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 the philosophy in, uh, in um, shore protection is that whatever you construct is going to, to uh, affect the, the, the balance in the sediment transport that you have. In all coasts you have sediment transport across shore, along shore. And as as uh, as soon as you build something, you will you will uh, uh, change the balance in some way, and uh, and then uh, you you're left you're left to if if the problems are are uh, are too or if the the changes occur too fast, you have to protect in some way, or you or you build somewhere else, uh, but. Uh, if the structure is, in, is built, you have to, pro to you have to protect it in some way. But you you may very well you will probably displace the problem. You will probably you will possibly uh, avoid that material is removed from the places that are protected. But then you will get the problem for, further away, mm -hmm. most probably. Do, do you think that that the erosion near Cap Amsterdam so was created by the construction of that kai or uh, that is a natural process? Which which erosion? Erosion from that uh, west side. So it was some uh, protection built by the back getting back in last yeah. year. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in Svea they have uh, there there is a harbor that was built uh, in 2000, yeah. uh, I believe, and uh, they have a, a coal harbor and then they have a goods goods harbor, and uh, the so the goods harbor is um, uh, is to the east of the coal harbor and in between the two there was a soap failure, and uh, there was a project uh, connects project to, to, to my PhD uh, that uh, constructed a protection structure with uh, geosynthetic uh, bags in, in that area. And, uh, but the erosion right there, um, your question was if it... No, I, I mean about, uh, further to the, from the west side of the kite. Yeah. So the, there is uh, some new build-up, new construction for right. getting out back because there is lack from the transporter and uh, it is dangerous that something can be broken because of the erosion. Yeah, uh, so you're asking if, if the new structure will cause... Yes, that is, uh, it happens because of the kite influence or that is natural some process for that? Yeah, I, I believe it is because of the key... The, yeah. uh, what I've observed over there is that uh, the, the, the waves the waves come in, in this... It, it's, um, um, the, the, the waves can get in this area, and you have a special wave regime with reflection, and mm -hmm. and I think they combine, and 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 this reflection is due to the presence of the of the keys. So so I believe that you would not have that kind of erosion if if you didn't have the keys there. Well, I think we have to conclude here. We thank you again for uh, for the presentation. This uh, session is now adjourned, and we meet again here tomorrow morning, 9.30, in this room, yes, for the public defense of the doctor thesis. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back tomorrow.